Jason Tatum and the Celtics embarrassed the 76ers in the second half, winning quarter number three 33 to 10 and setting off to see from there. Blowing like water, Tatum gave Mama Brandy a Mother's Day present she'll never forget, dropping a cool 50 piece, 51 to be exact, the most in Celtics history by far and the most in NBA history for a game seven as well. Mixing with Jalen Brown to score a fitting 76 points, the 12 other players for the 76ers would score just 12 more points than that combined. YouTube tells me that just 13.1% of my audience is subscribed, so please subscribe back to the content. Despite the quote-unquote, it's rigged trolls claiming Eric Lewis, whose family posted a picture in Celtic jerseys a few years back, was there for the league's agenda to get Boston to the finals, if you were watching this one, the whistle was actually against Boston the entire night. Conspiracy theorists like that are the same ones who were triggered by the NBA's Twitter page, merely stating a fact that both Boston and LA have 17 championships, albeit maybe not the smartest decision by the league to put that fact next to the finals preview, but nevertheless, those thinking the NBA is the WWE expose themselves as having zero internal dialogue one day after the next. Ben Simmons took it all in from afar, posting a picture of the game on his Instagram story. What a guy. Simmons would watch the pairing of Joel Embiid and James Harden score just 24 points on 29 shots. Joel Embiid's minus 9.4 points per game drop-off from the regular season to the playoffs is the biggest drop-off by an MVP of all time. If you missed the game, this right here is essentially how the game went in the second half, with Boston going on a merciless 24-3 third quarter run. Oh, and with a devastating shot to the ribcage. When Jason Tatum's as locked in as he was on Sunday afternoon, the man is unstoppable. With Tatum's Giannis-type long strides and expeditious slashing, mixed with his polished, deep bag of dribble combos, blended with elite shooting footwork, and fused together with an incessantly measured feel for the game, defenders are forced to carefully select their venom. The reason Jason Tatum is one of my favorite players is because he lets his game do every bit of the talking for him. He picks his words with astuteness and clarity. With that said, he did have some words to back up in this one, saying after game six, quote, humbly, I'm one of the best players in the world, end quote. To be fair, that was after scoring 16 of his 19 points in game six, all in the fourth quarter. But as I mentioned in my game six reaction video, Tatum was 0 for 19 in his last three first quarters. Taking that knock personally, whether it was withering momentum crossovers leading to destructive attacks, Dirk Nowitzki one-legged fallaways from the post, utilizing elusive triple threat moves leading to drives or whirling dervishes through the lane, Tatum was conversely a man on a mission early on in Game 7. Jason's post-up game and rim pressure opened up room for his perimeter bag to flourish, where he would dice up Philly's drop coverage with a slight drive entry to his left after maneuvering off this spread ball screen before nastily breaking out a KG off-handed in-and-out dribble and moving jab step before transitioning into a step-back bomb to cap off the first half. Tatum responded astutely to what I said regarding his first quarter drought, going off for 14 quick points in the opening quarter, 25 in the opening half, and he would only pick it up coming out of Joe Mazzulla's locker room, balancing out that first half in historic fashion by adding 26 points in the final 24 minutes. When Tatum's aggressive like he was on Sunday, what makes him unstoppable in addition to that is the St. Louis native's ability to freeze anyone with that patented in and out hezzy. Generally, Jason's array of combinations on the perimeter are extremely tough to gauge, the Sixers went from drop coverage in the first half into switch defense on pick and rolls down the stretch, and Jason would begin to expose Joel Embiid in isolations. The godfather Al Horford had a momentum shifting steal and block on Embiid in the early third quarter. What a defensive clinic it was for Big Al all series long, as he was a monster at locking up Embiid throughout this entire seven game battle, even at one point blocking Joel on three consecutive possessions back in game four. 
Malcolm Brogdon added 12 points off the pine. Brog didn't have the best shooting night, but seven of his points came in the fourth quarter, and he did a good job putting full court pressure on Harden. All around, solid two-way performance from Obama. As the game progressed, you could tell by the eye test that Boston's defense on the bearded one and M flop, I, I mean Embiid, was just going to be too much for the Philly duo to overcome. Horford spoke on what he did to stop the reigning MVP, saying, quote, Just try to make everything as difficult as I could. He's the MVP of the league for a reason, and how much pressure he can put on our defense and so many things he can do. So I was just out there trying to fight for my life and trying to make an impact, and I understood that in this series it wasn't going to be my offense, it was more defensively that I had to take that challenge and defend him for us to have a chance." End quote. You don't want to, nobody wants to ask about all the adjustments we made? Coach Missoula spoke on the adjustments Boston made on Embiid even before Sunday's outing, actually entering Game 6, saying, quote, When we were down 3-2, we made an adjustment, but it opened up their minds. It opened up their connectivity to be able to do a bunch of different stuff, whether it was doubling from different locations, whether it was going small on Embiid, and then switching the matchup in the middle of the possession, whether it was rotations we made. Credit to our guys for just being open-minded, being connected, and you can't guard those guys one way. You've got to do different things. So with their effort and communication, it really helped to do that, end quote. Opposing coach, on the other hand, and Doc Rivers, was trying to stay engaged with clapping on the sidelines early in the fourth, as well as getting into that patented bent-down stance of his. <laughs> come on, man. I mean, come on, man. Come on, man. You're making money. Come on. But you could just tell that Rivers seemed to be shook as the Celtics continued to extend their lead teams coached by Doc have now forfeited a staggering seven playoff series with either a 3-1 lead or a 3-2 lead. Shout out Blake Griffin for getting the W over his former coach with the Clippers. It's amazing how Boston's rookie head coach would outduel such a veteran in Doc, a man in Rivers who's lived off his 2008 ring for three presidencies now. But from a Boston perspective, the A-plus vibe-enhancing motivator the youngest head coach in the NBA, Joe Mazzulla, who's done an outstanding job since day one, encouraged his team on the sidelines to not worry about anything else and to stay in the moment. If this Celtics team can maintain that mentality, they're bound for something special. You can just tell that unlike a lot of head coaches, Mazzulla lets his assistants have a big time voice as well. The question for Boston of course now becomes, can they finish the job? It's going to be the franchise's fifth Eastern Conference Finals appearance in the last seven years, which in itself is a great accomplishment. But knowing the roaring passion yet humbly poised love from the Celtics faithful, they won't be satisfied, or even happy for that matter, with anything less than ring number 18. Whether it was the days of Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, and Ray Allen, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish, or Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, and John Havlicek, this Celtics franchise is prestigious no matter what happens. That said, this Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and Marcus Smartfield era won't feel complete without a championship ring. Joel Embiid, meanwhile, had a message for us all. Konnichiwa. Get ready to learn Japanese. Buddy, it won't be long before you're playing point guard for the Wong Dong Tigers. You trash ass motherfucker. Fuck out of my face with that bullshit. The 76ers have now lost their last three game sevens, first of which came against my Raptors, second of which came against the Atlanta Hawks. But this third multi sided winner go home L maybe even topped the pain Kawhi inflicted on the 76er fan base in 2019. That's because they had everything going for them in the first half, but just fell off a proverbial cliff out of the locker room. In three years, society and NBA culture has shifted by centuries, but one thing has stayed the same. The four remaining teams that we had in the bubble. Unbelievable how the bubble haters have seen their prized narrative blow up in their faces, as Boston, Denver, Miami, and Los Angeles represented the final four in the bubble, and now they represent the Final Four in 2023. The vibes have suddenly maxed out to a thousand in Beantown, given the Celtics crowd lived up to Jalen Brown's expectations 
as JB called out the TD Garden faithful prior to Game 7, but would say post-game, quote, I called the Garden out last game. Way to respond. The energy in the building was through the roof. It was amazing, end quote. Brown would also call out George Niang for grabbing his knee in an Instagram post, something I'm sure will continue to fuel my boy JB heading into round three. In that post, Jalen would caption it with his patented saying of, the energy has shifted. Brown would also speak on how the Seas overcame facing elimination twice against Philly, saying, quote, resiliency is key. Sometimes you gotta go through tests to prove if you're worthy to move on to the next level, end quote. More resiliency is surely to be faced as Boston prepares for a rematch of last year's conference finals against a Heat team that's overcame a ton of adversity themselves, having taken out the number one seeded Bucks and a breakout New York Knicks team. After losing home court advantage in their last series right off the bat to Philly, I'll have my eye on the sense of urgency Boston plays with in their next game one on Wednesday. It should be an excellent battle featuring Tatum and Brown, versus Jimmy and Bam. It's already been a heated battle between two prominent figures from each team's fan base, that's for sure. Firstly, here was Boston's Dave Portnoy of Barstool. There's no chance in hell that he beat the Celtics. It's the finals. Now, I don't know who's coming to the West, but I'm going to say this. If it's Braun Braun, it's a legacy series for me, and that will be a good series. I'm not saying, see, I'm Mr. Realistic, Davey Realistic Portnoy. I'm not saying we sweep the finals. The Joker or the Lakers, that's a real series. We're going to blow through Miami, and then it's going to be on. Banner 18. Philly, I feel bad for you. If I could slap you in the butt and say, just keep your chin up, keep your chin up, little scumbag, I would. Sorry, scumbags. You're just not as good as us. You're just not. That's what it is. Don't be, it's almost cruel and unusual punishment. They get your hopes up just to get mashed like that. Tough day to be a scumbag, but I'm on to the finals. Yes, I said the finals, NBA finals, NBA finals. But Miami's Donald, I mean, Josh Rosen would clap back at Dave. Excuse me, little David Porter. We're going to knock the hell out of the nasty, low energy Boston Celtics. Big Al Horford is very old. He's even older than Sleepy Joe. And Jason Tatum gets tight under pressure. Heat in six. Whether it's between the four lines or the drama between fan bases, we're in for a classic Eastern Conference Finals clash with Miami looking to exact revenge and Boston looking to defend its Eastern Conference throne. 